one already a long time ago. And uh, in 2008, she changed to where she is now, which is called Alton University right now. She's also had a guest professorship at ETH Zurich. And uh, as I said, Pavi is a well-known uh, theorist in the field of cold atoms. I actually worked with her very early on because she was the one that originated the idea of R spectroscopy probing uh, superfluid pairing in atomic gases with R spectroscopy. She had a pioneering paper on that with uh, Peter Zoller. And then Pavi and I had a follow-up paper together. Uh, but she's doing lots of things. So today she's uh, she will talk about uh, quantum geometry. Uh, she's also doing experiments. So she managed to do both theory and, ex and experiment. Uh, so she's doing exper experiments on nanophotonics and plasmonics, which is a completely different story. So that's it's quite impressive. She has a great uh, breath. And uh, I think I read that you are also. Are you? Uh, what was it I read that you are? You are yeah, the, you are part, when we for the Magenta Breakthrough Prize or something, or what was it? The, for yeah, yeah, I, head what? of the Millen, yeah, yeah, head of the Millennium Prize Committee, yes. Yeah, which is quite a bit of money, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should uh, try to ask a good questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, with that, we uh, go ahead and, and talk about your new stuff. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerd, for this uh, kind in invitation and the introduction. And as, as you said, I'm I'm old um, collaborator of yours, and you are also old. But uh, we are still <laughs> so you will see we are still doing. Uh, right. So let me try to um, share my screen. And I'll open the slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yes. And also the laser point. Good. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, indeed, as Kirk mentioned, uh, talk about two um, quite distinct topics. First is uh, theory only, or I mean, we are doing only theory there. And it's very much related to uh, quantum geometry and superfluidity of all kinds. And there, uh, I think we'll talk about these things and also the latest news, which is always very impressive. And then I go to our experiments where we have uh, seen Bose-Einstein condensation uh, in an ultra-fast uh, room temperature system. It really is pushing the limits of Bose-Einstein condensation. And, and there also the latest uh, news, we will see. Um, good. Uh, so let's start uh, from superconductivity. Uh, you all know how useful it is. It's uh, used for big magnets and quantum computers and so on. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to have this in room temperature? Because uh, for all these applications, the cooling takes actually a lot of energy. So there is a huge uh, potential if we could bring superconductivity to room temperature. And, but we are not there after decades of research. And it's very annoying because it's essentially just a factor of two from 150 to 300. Why we cannot do it? Usually factor of two is peanuts for a physics. So let's try to understand why is it so difficult? Uh, you also know that superconductivity is a Bose-Einstein condensate of Cooper pairs. And uh, Cooper pairs typically are born from some weak interactions between the electrons. And those weak interactions are competing with kinetic energy, which is very big. The Fermi energy is very big in metals and so on. And uh, the BCS theory then uh, tells that from this competition, it's actually uh, uh, the TC uh, critical temperature becomes exponentially suppressed. So here is uh, interaction. So this thing is very small when interaction is small. This is the density of states at Fermi level. So maybe we could uh, get rid of that kinetic energy part and let the interactions know it. And people have actually thought about it. That's a so-called flat band superconductivity. So uh, now here, here are some basics uh, from 
uh, textbooks. Uh, if you have a periodic system, uh, the solutions are block functions. Actually, now this periodic part of the block function will be quite important in this talk. And then you get the band structure ba with some bandwidth. And if uh, interactions are small compared to the bandwidth, you are in the dispersive band limit. Then if they are much bigger than the bandwidth, or maybe in the uh, extreme case of having no bandwidth at all, you can call it a flat band. And there, of course, group velocity as defined like this is zero. So flat bands are actually insulators at in any field. Now, what comes to uh, the Cooper pairing temperature? Interestingly, in a flat band, it's not exponentially suppressed, like in a usual case it becomes linearly proportional to the interaction and the volume of the flat band. So this has been uh, predicted, but this is really uh, just the pairing temperature. There is uh, still uh, something much more to understand. But uh, before going to that, let's see what kind of flat bands we are actually interested. Because you could also get a flat band by just pinning your particles so that they cannot move at all, but that's un uninteresting. These interesting flat bands come from uh, interference of wave functions. So for instance, if you have a lattice geometry, which is like this uh, uh, leap lattice, uh, you can imagine that you have states where you have amplitude here with minus sign and here with plus sign. And now if the particle tries to tunnel to this side, these destructively interfere and there is no tunneling. So this means that the particles get kind of localized to these sites uh, uh, via interference. Another way of uh, kind of producing flat bands is uh, if you have a periodic system and then you make a super lattice, then you have a smaller Brillouin zone and the uh, um, bands get folded and, and they repel each other and you may flatten the bands. These two are actually the same mechanism, but just seen more in the real space and in the reciprocal space. And then again, a Landau levels is a well-known example of flat bands. So this kind of thing, flat bands could be interesting for high temperature superman activity. But I said there is a problem now. Uh, in order to have a superconductivity, you have to have supercurrent, uh, Meissner effects, and so on. And as supercurrents is defined as the Cooper pair momentum times uh, the superfluid weight. So this uh, quantity has to be non-zero. In uh, conventional BCS theory, it's essentially uh, uh, related to the particle density divided by effective mass. And you see here what is effective mass is the band dispersion. So this would be zero if, at a flat band. So here we apparently have a, a big problem that they are pairs, but they don't move. Now, uh, in my group, we got uh, interested in this problem already uh, some time ago, and there is a series of work that I now uh, summarize here. Uh, I would like to mention Sebastiano Peota and Longlian, who were very important in these early papers, and also Alexi Yurku who is actually now a postdoc at Aarhus, so you probably all know him. And uh, especially lately, we have done very nice work. Uh, Alexi has uh, calculated these things for BC. Then we have also other collaborators, in particular the group of Sebastian Huber from ETH. So uh, what we did is we, we uh, considered the Hubbard model, with hoppings of the particles. I mean, particles, you can take, think about electrons or in ultragold gases, there would, would be some fermions in a lattice and they interact at one lattice site. And um, the new, uh, not new, but the essential thing here is that I have these indices alpha and beta. These mean that I have um, many orbitals in the unit cell. So this is really a multiband uh, system many orbitals, so sites in the unit cell means many uh, bands. And this is the index for that. And then we do BCS mean field uh, theory for this uh, model. And uh, to see where the supercurrent can go through, we introduce the Cooper pair momentum, which transforms the order parameter pairing gap like this. 
And then one can calculate the superfluid weight with various approaches. Here are just two of them mentioned that we have used both of them. The essential result is this. So we saw that in the superfluid weight, there is uh, what we call the conventional part, which is simply this uh, a derivative of the dispersion. This would be zero in a flat band, as I showed um, in this uh, slide where I introduced the problem. But then we noticed that there is another contribution, which uh, had been, not been noticed before. And we call it geometric. You will soon see why. And this one can be non-zero also in a, a flat band, and it's present only in the multiple case. And quite interestingly, at certain limits, it becomes uh, directly proportional to the interaction, just like the Cooper pair temperature, and a quantity called quantum metric. So what is this quantum metric? Well, it, it is what it sounds. So if you want to uh, define an uh, infinitesimal distance between two quantum states like this, uh, you can express it uh, as uh, this kind of um, index uh, or sum. And here you have a quantity, but this one is not gauge invariant. And these people introduced a gauge invariant version. And then they could write that the infinitesimal distance is this quantum metric times the change in the parameter. So this is very generic. This parameter k could be anything um, that parameterizes your quantum state. But if you want to think about lattice systems, you can think that this is the Bloch function and this is the lattice momentum. But this quantum metric is actually part of a bigger uh, object called quantum geometric tensor, which looks like this. And uh, it is its real part, while the imaginary part is the Berikovitz, a well-known famous Berikovitz. So this means uh, that uh, the quantum metric is actually connected to topology via being, you know, both of them are, are part of this object. And uh, this uh, quantum metric goes under some other names too. Okay, so with this nice connection uh, between uh, the quantum metric and, and the uh, Berikovitz, we can actually uh, derive this kind of fundamental bound, lower bound uh, for uh, superfluid weight. That there is always superfluid weight, that means supercurrent, if the band uh, has a non zero chair number. And by the way, this chair number here is a chair number for one spin, because this has been derived for time reversal symmetric. System, but it's like you can think about having different uh, sign magnetic fields for the two spins, and then you have a chain number. So this guarantees uh, superfluidity. And by uh, after that, uh, various groups have, uh, including ours, have uh, proven this uh, relation also via beyond mean field uh, methods. So why? Why is there uh, this kind of bound that is uh, related to topology and why there is a, a, at all uh, some kind of transport uh, of uh, Cooper pairs in these uh, systems where actually single particles behave uh, like an insulate? Well, um, uh, you can look at these pictures. So here I would have a system that I mentioned in the beginning where I um, localize particles uh, very tightly on the lattice side so that they, they cannot move. So then I have exponentially localized one year functions. And um, uh, you, uh, you can have a flat band here. And then you can have this other type of flat band where uh, the flatness comes from interference, but the one year functions still overlap with each other, even quite a lot. And then if you introduce interactions between particles, uh, in this uh, localized system, I, I mean, one-year function localized system, uh, the particles would just move on-site pairs which don't move at all. But then in the system where we have one-year function overlap, with interactions, these interferences get kind of uh, distorted, and, and then 
the particles can actually move. So this is uh, the thing behind and why this is related to topology is that um, uh, it's known uh, that topology is connected to how localized your one-year functions can be. For instance, it has been shown that if you have a finite set number, then your one-year functions must be non-localized. You cannot exponentially localize it. So this makes more understandable this connection to topology. Okay. So this was a very a neat uh, theory, theory, uh, 2015. But of course, there were not many experiments, uh, I think actually none, on uh, flattened superconductivity. But then came uh, twisted by layer graphene. And this, of course, uh, changed the story very much. So, so here you, you see Alexi, uh, whom, whom you all know, I hope, uh, by now. And, uh, um, other co-workers long from my group and Tero and Temu from Yuvaskula, we uh, started to look that, well, does this uh, flat, this uh, quantum geometric uh, superconductivity have any relevance uh, to this twisted bilayer uh, graphene superconductivity, which was the big thing of 2018. So at MIT, they, uh, they saw that if you take two graphene flakes, and twist them by a tiny angle, you get a system with this kind of large uh, unit cell Moyer pattern. And then uh, at certain conditions, you can see uh, superconductivity. And they also know that at the point where they see superconductivity, here at the Fermi level, they are almost flat bands. So we looked at this uh, and evaluated the uh, superfluid weight and uh, calculated separately the conventional and geometric parts and also the BKT temperature, which you can get from uh, superfluid weight. And we saw that most probably this geometric term uh, matters. Uh, so here is the interaction and this is superfluid weight. And for two different type of pairings, we see that this pink area uh, is the uh, conventional uh, part what would come only from the conventional part because the bands are not completely flat. They have a little bit of dispersion, so there would be this conventional superfluidity as well. And then this blue one is the geometric part. So depending on uh, where you are in the interactions, and we think it's probably somewhere here, it can be quite significant. So uh, this uh, conclusion was um, at the same time uh, basically made by another group so, and, and then the results are highlighted in this news article. You can Google for it if you want to uh, get some kind of easy to read uh, text about this. And uh, by now we have uh, already written a review article about uh, these things. So this is nice if you want to understand the quantum geometric superconductivity first, the basics and then how it can be relevant for the twisted multilayer systems. And we not only consider the uh, uh, graphene systems, but also uh, uh, explain how people are now creating uh, these Moyer systems with ultra gold atoms. So this is a uh, picture from a, from a beautiful experiment with ultra gold gases. And those of you who are from ultra gold gases Field, you can immediately interpret this. <laughs> and you see that for two, two different atomic states, you have uh, lattices that are slightly tilted from each other. And in this way, you can do this more systems. OK, so uh, then uh, I go to a slightly different topic. This is still uh, very similar. Uh, in the sense that it's about this quantum bit geometry, but now we go from fermionic to bosonic systems. So let's uh, think about Bose-Einstein condensates. Do we see some, same kind of effects there? Uh, so uh, this is a reminder of, of the basics uh, of a usual Bose-Einstein condensate. So if you have some kind of uh, dispersion here, for instance, a quadratic dispersion that you would have for uh, continuum system or, or close to some bandits. 
Uh, of course, the Bosch condensate would form in the, uh, in the uh, lowest energy state. But in a weakly interacting system, uh, it's very, very well known that you will have a so-called quantum depletion or a finite amount of excitations because of interactions. And the excitation fraction is, is known within Bogolyakov theory, it looks like this. So there is dispersion, interaction, and the density. Fine. So then now, if you take a flat band, meaning that the effective mass goes to uh, infinity, then uh, this formula immediately uh, gives you that uh, the excitation fraction goes to infinity. So, uh, so the poor bosons don't know where they would condense because uh, every energy has the is the same. I mean, every momentum has the same energy. So, in some sense, this excitations immediately. Um, spread everywhere and there is no condensate. So it's true that um, in a single flat band, Bose-Einstein condensate is not possible. However, this is the kind of trivial uh, flat band that I mentioned. But there are uh, also these uh, flat bands that come from interference. And in those uh, uh, kind of systems, it's known uh, that um, there can be Bose-Einstein condensates. But it was not known uh, like under what conditions uh, they occur and uh, what determines their stability and so on. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, we have uh, solved together with uh, Alexi and Georg. So uh, the theory is general there, but I explain why the Kagome lattice. So Kagome is a nice uh, lattice geometry because there is a flat band like this, and then two dispersive bands. And by chasing pa some parameters, you can put the flat band either to the bottom or the top. So here, for instance, you, we put a flat band to the top. And then, of course, Bose condensate forms here. So it's in a dispersive band. We can study the dispersive band case. And then we change so that the flat band is uh, here at the bottom. And then the condensate would form also for instance, in the K point of the brillouin zone, so here. And now we are interested that, okay, we have this condensate, but how is the quantum depletion? How are these excitations around it? How do they behave now in a flat band? And is the BC actually, when is it possible? Do we have a finite sign velocity and so on? And interestingly, uh, the result is that uh, now this, uh, important quantities of BC depend on the quantum geometry. So for instance, speed of sound. In a dispersive system, it's a square root of interaction times uh, density. And now in a flat band, it becomes linearly proportional to interaction. So even the interaction dependence is different. And then there is this quantum metric appear with the square root. And, and this we have, we have tested with the metric tells uh, whether you have a speed of sound. When it's finite, you have a bit same similar fashion like finite quantum metric uh, guarantees at the supercurrent. So here it's uh, the speed of sound, but there is a square root dependence here. Then we calculated this uh, excitation fraction. And that has a really remarkable uh, behavior that for vanishingly small interactions, it actually goes towards a constant that is determined just by quantum distances uh, between uh, the states in the flat band. So th this is also kind of uh, intuitive that um, like if the states would not be orthogonal at all, so this would be one, then you don't have any uh, distance and, and this goes to zero. Sorry. So no, yeah, this goes to one and then this goes to zero. <laughs> so, okay, never, no. Yeah, so but basically, um, and the, the better way to explain it is that, uh, in the single band uh, system, you, 
we thought that okay the exit stations uh, go to other k states immediately because the energy is the same but it's also important whether there are overlaps between uh, the k states if they if they are somehow yeah not orthogonal at all then it's easy for the uh, condensate to spread everywhere but if there are some orthogonalities this kind of uh, curtains the uh, spreading of the condensate to the other case states. So that's why there is a dependence on the quantum distance. And uh, you see, it doesn't depend on interaction. So when we decrease interaction, the flat band BC excitation fraction, it goes towards a constant, while in a dispersive band, it just goes to zero. So, so this means that if you now would, uh, you, are, you are somewhere here, and if you would decrease the total number of the particles, your uh, excitation fraction would uh, remain constant, meaning that the excitation fraction becomes bigger and bigger compared to the total number. So indeed, in a flat band, one can reach these situations where uh, quantum fluctuations and interaction effects are really prominent. Because with BECs, it's open that uh, the BEC itself is a big mean field thing. And the quantum effects, I mean, they have been, uh, of course, observed uh, also in Orbus and so on, but uh, it's usually very tricky to see. Uh, but um, in flat bands, uh, the quantum effects uh, will be very prominent. Okay, we have also looked at quantum geometry and light matter interactions in the solid state light matter interactions context, if somebody is interested. Right. So, so then uh, I, I will go to the news uh, saying that part of these um, things that I uh, told are actually incomplete or, or even wrong. And uh, this is always very interesting. So here I would really like to highlight my student, uh, Kukka Emilia Huhtinen. And uh, we had the pleasure to uh, collaborate uh, with the group of Andre Bernevik, uh, who, who could uh, show these things with a complementary method. So this, this is a very fresh article in the archive. And now the key thing there is that there has been actually a problem in this connection between superfluidity and, uh, uh, and quantum ge geometry. And it's a very subtle one. Uh, people have not noticed it because it's basically it's just one line in a supplementary of some some papers of our papers so so usually the the devil is in the supplementary so uh, there has been this uh, prediction done by us that uh, superfluid weight is proportional um, is given by the um, secondary what you the ground potential and uh, produces this re uh, result where you have interaction and this quantum geometric term, which is an integral over the quantum metric. So this is the quantum metric. Now, the problem here is that, um, let's see, if you have, for instance, this type of sleep lattice geometry that I saw. And here, let's assume that we keep always the tunnelings between sites uh, uh, constant, but we move the lattice sites in space. But this would be something trivial. It's like changing your Fourier con uh, conventions and Fourier transform conventions. And indeed, the superfluid weight is completely independent of that kind of moving of the orbitals. However, the quantum metric depends on it. And this has been known. So now we are relating an orbital independent quantity to orbital dependent quantity. So obviously there is a problem. And what is the reason for the problem? Well, there are assumptions, but time reversal symmetry assumption is fine. Then uh, there was in a previous literature in our papers an assumption that one can make uh, uh, the, or, the order parameters always to be real. And actually, if they are always real, this is valid, but they are not always real. They can actually differ. So uh, the, the argument, uh, I mean, uh, this, this shows what is the problem. So actually, 
the de definition of superfluid weight is that you have to take a total derivatives of the ground potential, which is the partial derivative minus some kind of term that contains further derivatives of the order parameters, of the imaginary part of the order parameters. And now uh, there has been this argument that, okay, let's make all the order parameters real. So then this uh, would anyway be zero and this term is not there. However, if you do such a transformation that makes the order parameters real, then you also change this one. So one should uh, calculate this for the transformed system. And this has not been done. So uh, we have now uh, shown that one must use these equations. And we also present some very nice methods of uh, using them in convenient way. And using this equation, we can show that is actually the minimal quantum metric that uh, determines superfluidity, not just any quantum metric, because that it depends on the orbital position, but the one that has the smallest possible trace. And if you use that, you can still connect uh, superfluidity and quantum geometry. So this is uh, uh, really important. And now with this uh, correct formulas, we can uh, we have, for instance, looked at um, if you have the Lieb lattice uh, where the band structure looks like this. And you you open the you can open a gap there by tuning a certain parameter. So here is the uh, critical temperature of superconductivity for different interactions for different gap openings. So so when you have a gap, you have an isolated flatband, and it's this lowest one. So we saw uh, that it's actually beneficial to have a, a band touching. So this Dirac cone coming here. And this is good news because in real systems, you usually have band touchings, you don't have isolated fat bands. <clears throat> and then the general message, which already have, we have made many times, is this that in this small interaction regime, like here, you see how dramatically better these fat band results are compared to this uh, gray line, which is a usual square lattice. So this would be a usual dispersion. It really goes orders and orders magnitude lower in this low interaction regime, while flat band superconductivity still gives a, a reasonably high critical temperature. Okay, so if you want to know about this uh, uh, quantum geometry and superconductivity things, you can read uh, all our previous papers, also the review paper. They are fine for the qualitative use, but then if you really want to calculate, now you have to look at this uh, latest paper. It, it contains the uh, completely correct formulas. Okay, so that was all about the first uh, the theory part, and now I go to our uh, experiments. So, uh, we have been interested in uh, uh, plasmonic lattice systems because there you can have a light that is uh, kind of bound into the nanoscale and uh, light matter interactions are very strong. So uh, if you have, for instance, these things here are nanoparticles that are about 100 nanometer uh, size and these structures are made by EV in lithography. Um, in this kind of structures, you can have plasmonic uh, excitations uh, in, in the particles. So this kind of surface plasmons that are partly light and partly electron motion. And they create very intense fields here. And they are in the nanoscale because they are partly electron motion. So you don't need to uh, worry about diffraction limit anymore. And then if you put them periodically arranged, of course, you get band structures like here. So this is the in-plane momentum and uh, energy, and you get clear band structures. So <clears throat> then the basic modes in these systems are so-called uh, surface lattice resonances. And uh, you can understand that uh, these uh, uh, plasmonic resonances at individual particles, which I described, they are like, uh, they act like little dipoles. So there is oscillation and radiation. And when you arrange them by lambda uh, from each other, of course, you get interferences. So um, 
And the diffraction order of this periodic structure that is in plane is now important. Uh, it uh, turns out that this uh, diffraction order hybridizes with the single nanoparticle resonance. So the single nanoparticle resonance is very broad in spectrum. And then the diffracted diff order would be at this wavelength. And there you get this kind of funnel shape of a hybrid mode called the SLR. And uh, it is dispersive, so you can give in-plane momentum to it. Uh, in, in, that corresponds to an angle, excitation, or emission, and, and then it has higher energy. And importantly, there are these band structures with clear band uh, bottom band edges. So we wanted to condense these SLR excitations into the edge of this band. And uh, where does our condensate sort of sit uh, conceptually? Because there are many uh, type of condensate that have, have light as a part of them. Um, there are photon condensates and, and then polariton condensates where you uh, combine excitons and uh, light into polaritons. And the uh, uh, thermalization mechanism is quite uh, different in each. Uh, it can be Coulomb. Uh, related relaxation, or it may use vibrational states of the molecules. Like in, in the photon BC, you emit and uh, absorb photons. And in the, between these processes, you uh, damp energy to the vibrational degrees of freedom. And in this way, you kind of cool the photons to the lower states. So our uh, uh, BC, uh, plasmonic BC at the weak coupling regime is uh, very similar to the photon BC, but ours happens like uh, three orders of magnitude faster. So the dynamics is really, really fast. That's the uh, difficulty actually there. And then we went to strong coupling regime and uh, our BC there is somewhere between uh, the polariton uh, lacing and, and the photon BC regime. So, so we have a few papers uh, on this already. And first about the uh, first one, where uh, Tommy Akala, Hakala and Antti Moilanen were really very important. And also Alexi is on this paper. So uh, <clears throat> we have this nanoparticle array, uh, which hosts these SLR modes. And uh, then uh, we combine it with a solution that contains dye molecules. So these dye molecules act like a bath that uh, helps us to thermalize the, the uh, photonic or plasmonic excitations. And um, uh, I mentioned these ultra fast time scales. We, have, we were thinking for a long time that uh, how can we ever show that there is some kind of uh, BEC dynamics going on um, because everything happens in picose picosecond or faster. And then this was the uh, uh, smart solution that uh, we um, detected the light that escapes uh, from the system, a spatial result. And uh, we pumped uh, the system with the femtosecond laser only in one end of the sample, which now makes these uh, molecules excited. And then the molecules uh, emit uh, light to these SLR modes and uh, at an energy where you have momentum so that the excitation start to propagate. And during the propagation, this thermalization happens. So we can actually monitor what happens in time by uh, imaging space. And the important um, energies that you have to keep in mind to understand all this is this band edge energy. Uh, which we can easily uh, tune by changing the period of the lattice. And then uh, the molecule energies, so it has a big stoke shift uh, from between absorption and em emission. And there is some energy where you basically don't have any absorption left, but you have some emission still. And here is a cartoon uh, how this uh, uh, thermalization happens. So we have uh, excited the molecules and now they are starting to emit. But we first tune the uh, bandage to be sufficiently low. 
And now um, light is emitted to the SLR mode. Then it's reabsorbed. But before it's emitted, again, there is vibrational relaxation. So you go to low energy. And then you go to the ground state and you have uh, this uh, bosonic stimulation of uh, uh, population there, bosonic condensation. And we see this uh, spatially now. I told about this uh, uh, spatial imaging, so this spectrum result in space. And here, really, you, you start by uh, excitation at the high energy, and then the light kind of goes towards low energies. And when it meets the band, it, it con condenses here. So that's a really neat way of seeing what happens. And uh, a standard question now is that how is this different from lasing? Because what we get out is a coherent bright beam. And in this system, it's very easy to uh, uh, show the difference. So now uh, we put the bandits even lower so that there is absolutely no emission, uh, sorry, absorption left, but there is some emission. So this point has a high gain. And then uh, you see lasing immediately there. So you don't see this thermalization process. So in this way, we can tune between easy and lasing. Okay, so that was in the weak coupling, uh, but we wanted to go to a strong coupling because we thought that uh, the phenomena will be even uh, richer there. And, and there, uh, again, Aro and uh, Anti uh, have been really important. And uh, now we didn't do this uh, propagation experiment. We just pumped uh, all over and observed the light that comes. And we are now in the strong coupling regime. So the molecules are no longer just a path. Uh, they actually hybridize with the SLR modes and make polaritons. You can see it by the bending of the dispersion here. So here is the exciton absorption and this uh, uh, dispersion has been bent. And we saw actually quite different phenomena there. So we still see a BC, but actually much nicer one. So, uh, but uh, quite funnily, um, we have two thresholds. So this is the pump fluence, uh, how much we pump the system. This is the out, output for the luminescence of the BC. So we see a first threshold where we get kind of something that looks like usual lasing, and this we call polariton lasing. And then a second threshold. And in this threshold, we really see a very beautiful uh, Bose-Einstein uh, distribution. This thermal tail, this slopes uh, matches room temperature, and, and then the condensate at the lowest energy of the band. And in, in this regime, uh, the spatial picture of the uh, condensate looks like this. So it actually has some high intensity area in the middle and lower intensities at the edges. I will come back to this. But yeah, the point is that in the strong coupling regime, we actually see much more beautiful, nice condensates. And that's what we have been working with uh, ever since. So <clears throat> one obvious thing, uh, if you have a condensate, is to look at the spatial and temporal uh, coherence. And uh, uh, this is a uh, work by Antti Moilanen and others, and Antti is now a postdoc at ETH Zurich, so he just left my group. So uh, the, uh, maybe many of you know that the story of uh, a long-range order in two-dimensional um, two BCs is very complicated. In 3D, uh, there is true long-range order, and it has been so shown and seen, for instance, in the uh, atomic species, but in uh, 2D, there was first this uh, theorem by Mermin and Wagner that there should not be any order, fluctuations, uh, uh, thermal fluctuations prevented. However, uh, 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 Beresinski and Kostelis and Taules have shown that yes, there is quasi long range order which decays only algebraically. And this is related to vortex and anti-vortex pairing. Uh, 
But these are equilibrium results. So uh, for instance, our condensate, if it uh, uh, dies in one picosecond, well, it's a, uh, yeah, it's certainly something between equilibrium or quasi-equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And many other condensates, uh, these photonic and polaritonic ones are like that. So what's the story for non-equilibrium condensate? Well, um, there are at least two uh, possibilities. People have shown that there could be still a non-equilibrium BKT transition with algebraic decay, just the exponents are a bit different than in uh, equilibrium. And then there is a completely different uh, 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 regime of uh, parameters where you see a completely different uh, phenomena, namely the KB set uh, type of dynamical phase ordering where the decay of coherence would be stretched exponential again with some universal exponent and maybe there would be even a crossover between these. So this is all very, very open still. So we wanted to see uh, what happens in our system. And um, uh, first of all, a clear message that we saw is that something very uh, different happens uh, for the uh, polariton lacing, the first threshold, and then above the second threshold where we have BC. So for instance, by cell coherence, we get a clear Gaussian decay for the polariton lacing, and above the BC threshold, it's either power law or stretch exponential, but these are very hard to tell from each other. So we wouldn't make any claim, except that it's not a Gaussian anymore. So whether it's a power law or stretch exponential, I won't play, but clearly non-Gaussian. And the same story in a temporal coherence, very clear difference. Below uh, the BC threshold, it's an exponential decay, which would be the usual laser theory. And then above, again, either power law or stretch exponential. So a clear transition in terms of uh, the type of coherence happens, but uh, these exponents that we got uh, did not match with uh, the known BKT or KP set physics. So there might be uh, that there is some new physics going on, or that we just didn't have a big enough system either way. But uh, it, it looks interesting, this BC regime, that you get some uh, nice uh, power law short stretch exponential behaviors there. Yes, so then uh, um, the last work about these BCs uh, is um, related to this, what I mentioned that there, there was this uh, high intensity area in the middle of our samples. Well, we, we never thought about it uh, deeply before this, uh, this study where we wanted to go uh, to uh, study basically vector fields. So far, we had always uh, pumped the system with one polarization and that somehow triggers also the polarization of the condensate to be in a certain direction. So, if we pump like this, we will see this and that's it. But of course, there is rich physics when, when you have a really a vector field and we have polarization that offers us the kind of the pseudo spin for the system. So we started to uh, then pump with circularly polarized beam that we could see all kinds of polarizations and the polarization result detection. And the result was completely surprising. So these ones, we understand, these look like what we have seen before. Depending on the polarization, we see this uh, high intensity area in the middle. But then uh, look at uh, this uh, filtering with uh, left and right circular polarization. In one case, it's the middle of the sample that is bright, and in the other, it's the edges. So something must be going on there. And from that, you can already think that, hmm, look, the difference between left and right uh, circular polarization, it's just the pace here. Okay. So it seems as if going from the center of the sample to the edge, the phase is changing. Some phase is changing because that, that allows you to go from RCP to LCP. And indeed, that was the case. So we uh, 
In this uh, work, we determined for the first time a BEC phase using a phase retrieval algorithm, and this now shows the phase. And indeed, there is a phase difference between the center part and the uh, edges, and this explains these patterns. Why there is a phase, uh, we don't exactly know. It could be some soliton, or it's an overall phase, phase function of the full thing, or something, but there is a phase. And it leads to these uh, really nice patterns. So if we, um, this is now in the language of Stokes vector, if you have a con constant phase, it, a Stokes vector would look like this, but the experiment gives us this. It's not the case. And then when we make this pi zero phase shift between the uh, center and the edges, we see what the experiment is showing. And there are some, uh, domain walls here, but the structure as overall is not topological, but one could pro probably uh, create also topological defects with uh, more elaborate samples. Okay, and, and then a couple of minutes uh, to the last work. So this is not in the VEC regime, this is uh, just lazy, but I wanted to show this uh, because it's really uh, promising considering uh, the future because here we see clear effects of time reversal symmetry breaking. Uh, we now did uh, this kind of uh, nanoparticle arrays with magnetic materials. And uh, there we collaborated with a group of Sebastian van Dijken. Uh, <clears throat> their group is uh, expert uh, in uh, nanomagnetism. So uh, now the nanoparticles are uh, made of uh, cobalt and platinum, and we have a structure where we also have a gold layer underneath. This we didn't have before. And then we can magnetize uh, these uh, nanoparticles with external field. And what we see is that when we get this uh, system lacing, of course, we have to again put dye molecules and pump with, with let's say, RCP pump. Uh, what we see is that depending on magnetic field, we see the lacing at slightly different energy. And we can also switch the lacing off and on using, by switching the magnetization. It's very uh, efficient. And this switching uh, happens because uh, um, the lacing threshold is slightly different or actually quite much different when we have up or down magnetization. So this leads to switching. And now what is the reason? Well, there is magnetic circular diaprism in this system, but uh, that's a tiny effect. It's below 1%. And, and here we see several percent shifts, for instance, in the threshold. So uh, this required quite a uh, deep uh, theory to understand. So we uh, calculated with a finite element method the uh, modes that this uh, system has. So it has the nanoparticles and the, and the gold layer down here. So the lacing mode looks like this. And then we notice that there are some kind of what we call hybrid modes where the nanoparticles and the surface plasmons of this gold layer kind of hybridized. They look like that. And uh, essentially, the lacing modes uh, are very narrow, and these hybrid modes are broad, and they are chiral. So this is the thing, that the magnetic fields lifts the degeneracy of the mode. So why there is degeneracy to begin with is because it's XY symmetric system. But now you break time reversal symmetry, and the degenerate mode split. So the lacing mode split and the hybrid modes also split. And now our explanation is that these hybrid modes, they eat the gain available differently depending on whether it's a sigma plus or sigma minus or different magnetization because they overlap with the gain differently. And this explains the threshold difference. And indeed, we see these two uh, lasing modes that are split. So this is nice for uh, switching of lasing, but uh, what is important for the future is that exactly this kind of splitting of degenerate modes 
why a magnetic field is needed if you want to make topological systems. So in these systems, one could really do a topological lacing uh, with magnetic material and, and not with, um, I'd say, artificial magnetic fields that uh, have been mostly used in topological lacing. So uh, I'm in the end now. So I told you that a flat band superconductivity is possible because of quantum geometry. And uh, the same story for BEC, it can be a stable due to quantum theory. And we have the new complete formula that you should use if you calculate these things. And uh, then I talked about the BEC in the plasmonic lattices and magnetic uh, effects in the same systems. And uh, obviously, yes, with flat bands, uh, the goal is to search whether this can really bring us to room temperature superconductivity. And in the plasmonic systems, we, we very much want to study quantum geometry and topology in the future. So thank you very much. <laughs>